But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. 1 John 1, 9 tells us, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this peace that we have now in America. We're praying for Israel and we're praying for her military and we're praying that Israel would also have peace. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, outline of the chapter. We're about to enter 1 Timothy chapter 3. And when we begin to cover this chapter, we're going to see in verses 1 through 7, qualifications for pastor teachers. In verses 8 through 13, qualifications for deacons. And from 9 to the end, we're going to cover a song the most famous song of the early church, Faithful is the Word. So, let's start out, I want to start out by reading it in my New King James, and then we'll take it apart in the original. My Bible reads like this, this is a faithful saving, that's not right, that's how it reads. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Well, tragically, there are a lot of failed, uh, measurable people out in life looking for something new to do. And they just, uh, they, they were a failure at their first job, and then they a failure at the second job, and then they failed at being a used car salesman. And then all of a sudden, they crack their Bible open, and they read this verse. And they say, oh, well, there's one last opportunity for guys like me who have failed at everything else. Desire to be a pastor. Well, that's not it at all. So what does it mean? Let's take a look at it in the original and get an idea. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Our very first word is pistis. Whole logos. This is, oh, I didn't hit share. Thank you. Go back. That one. So in the Greek, we have pistis whole logos. This is the title of Paul's favorite hymn. It means faithful is the word. And uh, you have faithful is the saying, so didn't translate too good for you. You also know this as the eternal security verse when you get over into 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. These is a direct uh, from the song that they sang and uh, we've gone through that one several times we're going to see several excerpts from this song the hymn has to do with bible doctrine and the importance of bible doctrine this particular hymn and fragmentations from it are found in first timothy 1 15 we covered that first timothy 4 9 Titus 3 8 and 2 Timothy 2 11 through 13. So we're going to take a look at that at the end of our chapter. This song, Faithful is the Word. After he gives the title of the hymn, he quotes from it. The first 
word in the English is if. And if you're a student of God's word, when you see that in the English, you question yourself, well, I wonder what uh, condition that is because you know there are four different conditional clauses that come with that word if. And so the con conjunction I, which introduces a first class condition, and that means it's true, called a supposition from the viewpoint of reality. This condition is used when the writer wishes to assume the reality of his premise. We translate it, if and it is true. So we have a first class condition with this if. By the way, if your pastor's not teaching from the original language, he can't get this. And when he sees if, he, he translates it in the English. I don't know. If. If only if. Bad. Bad work. The next phrase is amen. It's the indefinite pronoun tis, which is used to represent a certain category of the royal family of God. This category is top leadership category. It is covered here from the standpoint of aspiration. That's going to be a key word in our exegesis, aspiration. Since it is already recognized that Timothy has the spiritual gift, it is going back now and examining his aspiration. Now remember, this is a letter written to young Timothy, and uh, it's got him in the spotlight. Desire is the word of aspiration. It's the present mental indicative from horregomai, which means to reach out, to aspire, to seek to attain something high or great, or seek to attain a place of leadership. I'm going to come back to that phrase right there. To seek to attain a place of leadership. So, what's up, Brad? You're telling me that the used car salesman guy that failed can come in here and be a pastor. No, he can't. I want to take you back. And I want you to look at how you got your spiritual gift. And the first thing we need to do is look at 1 Corinthians 12. And I'm going to share it here in my blue letter Bible. 1 Corinthians 12. And it tells us how you got your spiritual gift. Now, at the moment of your salvation, God ascribe to you one spiritual gift and in first corinthians 12 7 it tells us i'm reading from the king james now but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all that means he is using his spiritual gift i want you to look at this in the original though did he desire that gift that the Spirit gave him is the question. Did he get to choose is the question. Let's look at it in the original. I want you to see here. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Is given is in the, it's a verb. It's in the present tense, which means habitual action in present time. But look, look it's in the passive voice. That means the subject receives the action of the verb every time. You didn't do anything. It's just like salvation. You didn't earn it. You deserve it. You received it. Passive voice. Indicative mood statement of reality. So God the Holy Spirit is the one that ascribed your spiritual gift and you received it. I want you to look at another verse. I'm going to bring up Romans chapter 12 verse 6. These two sections in the Bible outline spiritual gifts, by the way. Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Well, I want to look at, uh, let's see here. I 
Okay. I actually wanted to look at, for one thing, when Paul says, for I say through the grace given unto me, well, what was that grace? It was the grace gift of apostleship. How was it given? Did he beg for it? Guess what? Aorist, that means at one moment in time, when he was born again, remember on the road to Damascus, passive, he received the action of the verb, the grace that was given, apostleship. And so you see that spiritual gifts are given as a system of grace. No one asks for the gift that they have. And uh, over and over again in the Bible, you're going to see the passive voice. I want to turn I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 through 9 and this is possibly the finest outline of Paul's apostleship and <clears throat> in Ephesians 3 we find out that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles in the church age. He says in Ephesians 3.1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, and that's another name for the church age, which is given me to you or you all. All right, you hear that? Given, not chosen. Given. Ephesians 3.3 3, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now you know that Jesus Christ taught Paul personally when you read in Galatians as I wrote afore in a few words whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mysterion of Christ. Now remember that word mysterion means not known to those on the outside, but absolutely known by those on the inside. Ephesians 3, 5, which in other ages was not known unto the sons of men. That means in the Old Testament we weren't spoken of. Even all the way up until Christ we weren't spoken of as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister. Did he choose it? No. God the Holy Spirit gave spiritual gifts according to the gift of grace given to me by the effectual working of his power, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is grace, what, chose? Given. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and make all men see what is the fellowship. That word fellowship is another name for dispensation. What is the dispensation of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. That means if your pastor tells you there is prophecy being fulfilled, he is a fool. We, weren't, we didn't have to be here, and therefore there is no prophecy assert associated with the church age, only its end, who created all things by Christ Jesus. And so you see that spiritual gifts are not chosen. They are given, they're sovereignly bestowed by God the Holy Spirit the moment you're born again. Now, we're going to look at spiritual gifts for this is all over, and we're going to find out that the Bible lists 20 spiritual gifts and that only 10 of them were operational in the church age. 
and uh, we're going to look at why some of them ceased and uh, how even Paul as an apostle that gift ceased to be right now. Now, what I wanted you to get was the fact that God decides your gift. And it's our job to figure out what it is. You may say, well, how do I do that? Well, the number one thing is you've got to study Bible doctrine. And you, that you want to learn what the gifts are and how they function. And then you may want to actually get out there and try. Well, you know what? I want to, work, I, I want to serve God in the local church and I'm going to do uh, so I'm going to function under some of these gifts, and I want to see if God confirms it to me. And uh, he will or not. He will confirm that you do not have the gift, and you'll gladly give up the operation of that gift when somebody comes by and says, let me help. <laughs> you can pray for God to reveal that gift to you, but re re remember that God, it has, he has no obligation to reveal your gift to you if you're not going to use it. And so uh, you, the number one issue in learning what your spiritual gift is is Bible doctrine and the advance to maturity. So let's continue on. Horegomai means to reach out to aspire, to seek to attain something high or great. To seek to attain a place of leadership. The present tense is a tendential present. It is used for an action which is purposed or attempted, but right now is not taking place. The middle voice, the subject, acts with a view towards particip participating in the results of the action. It is a permissive middle that represents the agent as voluntarily yielding himself. It might be said that the verb comes in at a point at which any male believer has reached the point of spiritual growth leading to the awareness and aspires to become a pastor. I love it because I learned this doctrine before I went to the Philippines. And Ma'am Nellie came up to me and she said, we're praying that my son has the gift of pastor." His father had died. His father had built a church. His father had built a school. And they didn't they had a temporary pastor in their teaching because his father had passed away. And Mrs. Daniel, Arno Hinkiana. And I said, No, 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 no. I said, Don't you pray that for any member of your family. I said, Don't you do it because the, the entrance into the gift of pastor-teacher is one of huperetes. That is the under-rower. And uh, that is the slave that was chained in the second row of oars inside the slave ship. And uh, all the refuse from the top row, see they were chained, they couldn't go out to the bathroom fell on the second row. Welcome to the ministry. <laughs> and then you take a look at the number two man on earth during the life of Jesus, which is John the Baptist. And uh, there he was in the desert wearing camel skins, biting grasshoppers, and maybe dipped them in a little honey. And so... A lot of people get to thinking real glamorous about a pastor, but I'm going to tell you, the true meaning of being a pastor teacher in the age of apostasy means that you will be shunned from the moment you begin to teach Bible doctrine until you die. And we're going to learn, it tells us that people will not endure sound teaching. That is the uh, one of the characteristics of believers at the end of the church age. And so I told Ma'am Nelly, I said, don't you pray for him. And I looked right at Daniel and I said, I've got this thumb drive 
and I'm giving it to you. And on it is everything you need to fulfill the ministry of a pastor. I said, but don't you dare do it if you don't have the gift. You sit down and you be quiet. Don't you speak a word if you do not have the gift. I said, but if you have the gift, you can't shut up. And you teach the word of God in season and out. And you teach it right here from this thumb drive. And I left. And so later on he did. He studied and studied and studied. And now he is teaching out of his father's church. So the word desire means that this young pastor aspires because he has recognized his spiritual gift. Let's keep going. The office of a bishop, the genitive singular from the noun episkopos, from the which uh, word we get episcopal. The word episkopos is actually a noun that means a superintendent of a factory or an overseer of a plantation. However, the basic meaning of the word is guardian. It is used of persons who have a definite function or fixed office within a group. The translation guardian is the best here. Guardian of the local church. This is one of the many words for pastor teacher. And it is also one of the responsibilities of the pastor teacher. He is the guardian of the local church. The guardian of the pulpit the guardian of the flock. It refers to the pastor of the local church with an emphasis on his policy-making and decision-making function. And I'll tell you, I have simplified my ministry by a thousandfold by this one policy. We will fo focus on the teaching of God's Word, and that will be the focus of our ministry, and everything else comes in a distant second place. And once you do that, you have you have cut chase uh, cut loose of a lot of problems that pastors will endure. He desireth is the present active indicative of epithumeo, means to desire, to long for. The historical present tense is used as a past event. It's viewed with the vividness of a present occurrence. So Paul takes Timothy back to his aspiration days when he came under Paul's teaching. The active voice, a certain category of male believer in the local church aspires to the pastoral office. And he has the desire and honorable thing in doing so. Aspiration is related to having a certain amount of doctrine in the soul. The indicative mood is declarative for a historical reality. And so, doctrine is the first step to recognizing the spiritual gift, and then aspiration to fulfill the gift comes from that. The next phrase is a good work. The work for good, the word for good, is a, the objective genitive singular from the adjective kalos. Kalos means here honorable. The word for work is the objective genitive singular from ergon, which means office. So now we have a good translation. Let's look at it. Faithful is the word. Now he is giving us a Phrase from the hymn, faithful, faithful is the word. And so this was part of their song. If anyone aspires to the office of guardian of the local church, he has desired an honorable office. The bad thing is is so many people are dumb about spiritual gifts and that the charismatics 
have the exact opposite teaching of what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God teaches that at the moment you were born again, that's the aorist tense, a moment in time, when you were saved, God the Holy Spirit decided for you which spiritual gift you would have. Over and out. And the first mistake that the charismatics make is the fact that they can't understand the aorist tense of sozo. That means that you were saved in one moment of time when you believed in Christ. Every one of us have the same testimony. I believed in Christ and God saved me forever. That's our testimony. They can't nail it down. They feel a little more saved one day than they do the next. They can't get the idea that God saved them at one moment in time. They believe they're saving themselves by being good. And then also they teach that one day you might get to experience your spiritual gift. And it's usually associated with some ecstatic experience of a supernatural kind, they claim. And so they're working towards having an ecstatic experience. And you, and you see, that's not how you get to your gift at all. You know how you get to your gift? A lot of boring Bible classes stacked one on top of the other. So they're going the opposite direction of what they really need to do. Well, God gave us all a spiritual gift. He also gave you a natural talent or ability. And uh, we should use both of them to glorify God, not self. We're going to come back to spiritual gifts. I need to summarize our verse for you, though. We've got nine points of summary. Point one, note that this passage does not cover the office of guardian of the church from the viewpoint of the spiritual gift. The spiritual gift is pastor-teacher, but it covers it from the principle of aspiration. The word desire in your English Bible. Point two of summary, this spiritual gift of pastor-teacher, the communicating part of the guardian, is sovereignly bestowed by God the Holy Spirit to certain male believers at the point of salvation. I'm going to go ahead and read the spiritual gifts that are still functioning while you're writing in your notes. Spiritual gift number one, evangelist, given to males only. It's a supernatural ability to gather large groups of unbelievers and entertain them until you drop the gospel right in their laps. Very scintillating gift. Spiritual gift number two, pastor teacher, given to males only. It's a supernatural gift of the ability to teach the mystery doctrine of the church age. Spiritual gift number three, teacher given to males and females. It is the supernatural ability to teach the mystery doctrine under the authority of a pastor teacher. See, the pastor teacher has the outline of theology and the, the teacher sits in class and learns it and then teaches it again. The fourth gift is exhortation. It is the counseling gift. It might include the encouragement for others, but it also might include a little bit of what the word exhortation means. 
step on your toes. Most of the time when you're listening to someone's problems, if they want help, you can outline which doctrines they need to be centralizing on. And then you can, once you listen to all their problems, you can hand them the prescription. You need to listen to 1969 basics and don't come back to me until you get them. Or the first couple of tapes, you're going to get it. You're going to get it, the sore. Most people can't handle the first few tapes. Exhortation. Mercy has got gift five. It is the get spiritual gift without eyes. This spiritual gift can help in places where you or I would not be able to normally help. Spiritual gift number six is helps. It is the linebacker of the local church. This is the person who steps in the gap, sees the need, and fulfills it. Spiritual gift seven is administration. That is the, a lot of deacons have this gift. They can organize operations in the local church. Spiritual gift eight is ruler. Now this person works closely with two other gifts. The gift of helps would be under him, and he's telling them what to do. The gift above him would be administrations or deacons, and they're helping them along the way. So it's a team. The ninth gift is ministry. And this is where someone has the gift to see a need for ministry and get it operating. And I'll tell you, just watching those videos of those kids over there in the Philippines is just almost overwhelming for me sometimes because I know that there is a spare room in the same facility that they live in, and it actually has a shower. Doesn't it have hot water? I think it did have hot water. It's amazing. For in the Philippines, you know, normally they don't have that type of thing. And uh, it's just waiting for someone to step in and do it. And uh, if I could go over there, I would take about six Briggs and Stratton engines. And I would teach those kids how to take those things apart and put them back together blindfolded. They'd be like Forrest Gump, taking his rifle apart and putting it back together. How did you do that so fast? You told me to. Not my gift, though. Tenth gift is giving. Supernatural ability to give above and beyond what is normal. You have one of these gifts. God the Holy Spirit sovereignly bestowed it upon you at the moment of salvation. It's your job to grow up enough spiritually to learn what it is and begin to function in it as outlined by the Word of God. Point three, the prerequisite then to aspiration is simply this. Aspiration dem demands that you have the gift and a certain amount of doctrine. Aspiration comes from the result of spiritual growth. The consistent function of GAP, the academic discipline of the local church, it is followed by the individual recognition of possessing the spiritual gift. And you could say aspiration is involved in any ten of these gifts. You say, I think I may have the gift of helps. And I aspire to use it. Well, guess what? That is honorable. And I have function in the gift of helps. Um, and I used to show up, I used to ride my bicycle to church and I would blow, I had the leaf blower out in the parking lot and then I had the broom on the steps and I had the vacuum cleaner going inside the building. And uh, before anybody showed up, I had that thing cleaned up and ready to operate. And that's what the gift of helps does. It just simply steps in the gap.
Point four, summary, possession of the gift is not enough to reach the pulpit, the office. After aspiration, there is still another stage. In other words, you may recognize the gift. It takes some preparation. I'm getting ahead of myself. Point five of summary, then. One must not only possess the gift, but through maximum doctrine in the soul, aspire to the office. And the aspiration becomes the basis for preparing for the ministry. And I believe in the 10 to 1 ratio for pastor teachers. You spend 10 hours studying and one hour teaching. 10 years preparing, one year of service. And if you're not willing to endure the 10 to 1 ratio, don't get started. I went through a very painstaking process of learning while working I had to take my seminary on tapes and I started out in a room that was about seven feet wide and about 18 feet long and it was dark and musty but inside there I had all of my tools that I needed to port cylinder heads and I had my tape player and my notebook. And I'd turn that tape player all the way up to be able to hear it over my grinder. Then they'd come to a point of doctrine. I would write down that axiom. i come to a question. I'd hit pause and I'd write down my question. I usually wrote it over here on the left side. But I'd keep listening even though I'd, I had the question. I know what that meant. Two or three tapes later, I could flip back in my notes and write down the answer to that question. That's why you keep going. You don't give up when you just have questions. But you have to be able to prepare yourself for the ministry. And I endured. I... I it's going to cost you, okay? It's going to cost you something. And while every one of you could be out making money right now, you're purchasing the day with Bible doctrine. You say, well, when's my payday? Guess what? It's coming one day. Bema. Point six, aspiration becomes motivation for training, preparation, and provides the self-discipline necessary to attain the office. While there are strong points and weak points in any pastor's ministry I would say the number one principle that pastors need to hear is this you don't have to be an expert in the original languages but you need to study from someone who is and that's the reason that I teach from the notes that I do Point seven, the verse, this verse, one, recognizes that those who aspire to the office of pastor or guardian of the local church have previous received the gift at the point of salvation, have previously taken in a lot of doctrine under the function of gap, and have previously been motivated to continue until they reach this point. They have endured all of the trials and testings that God has for them in their preparation.
1.8 is the opposite side of the coin. Not all who receive the gift of pastor teacher at salvation attain to attire of the office. Lack of aspiration means lack of doctrine in the soul. It takes doctrine for aspiration. Notice, inspiration is not aspiration. Inspiration is a tank full of gas, and when you run out, you've had it. Aspiration is biblical and doctrinal. Inspiration is emotional. Inspiration is a preacher boy walking the aisle and saying, God helping me in obedience to mother's prayers, I am going into the ministry. Inspiration doesn't mean a thing. Aspiration means everything. Aspiration is the gutting motivation that keeps a person going during his training. And I always knew this, even as uh, in my growing, before I ever knew I had, uh, never, but I never had the gift of pastor teacher confirmed to me yet. I was just learning and I was on fire for God, man. I had Bible doctrine on my nightstand. I had it on the lunch table at lunch. When I was drinking my coffee in the morning, I was reading it. I, w I There wasn't a moment that I was awake that I wasn't taking in some concepts of Bible doctrine. And I'd, all I wanted was more because the more I learned, the more questions I had and the more questions I got answered. And this thing was coming together for me. And I have one of those minds that I just knew that I could put together this thing and I have this piece, this piece, and this piece, but I was liking this one, this one, and this one. But I knew the system was out there and that I could learn it. And I was about to put together, because of guys who came before me, a system of orthodox Bible doctrine. That means that everything works together. Aspiration is gutting motivation. And there were times when I was tested and I didn't know what was happening to me because I was doing the right thing and bad things were coming my way. Man, I'm at work and um, I got a 55 gallon barrel I boil blocks in and, and uh, I had a hoist hanging from the tree above it and it was sitting on center blocks. And I had an old gas burner under there, and I would turn that thing on and leave those blocks in that acid water overnight and cook all the grease and the gunk off of them. We'd pull it up with a horse and power wash it. But my burner had gotten stopped up because the fire ants got in under them bricks. And I had a hand there, and I said, okay. I said, you're going to have to lean this barrel up, and I'm going to have to drag that burner out. And and it weighed probably three or four hundred pounds and the big old boy he pushed it up and I got the burner and I said, All right, flop it down. And when he flopped it down, I went, BAM. And then I took the burner and I began whacking it on the side of that barrel just to knock all the old fire ant dirt out of it. Man, that old fire ant dirt was lodged in that burner. But then I had to get the dirt out from under the barrel. So I put on pigskin fixed fence building gloves. And I began to take big handful of fire ant mound and drag it out from under the barrel. Well, I finally got to one corner and I reached, reached way back for a pile of dirt and pow! I, it felt like somebody shot me with a 22. I jerked my glove off and I looked at my hand and there were two yellow dots of fluid on either side of my knuckle right there. And I said, oh boy, I looked under the barrel and there was a 18 inch copperhead wound tight. I broke the first country boy rule, don't put your hand where you can't see. My back was hurting a little bit that day. I didn't feel like bending down, I paid. Well, before you knew it, it felt like somebody smacked my hand with a hammer and then shot battery acid mixed with gasoline in my veins. 
and this stuff began flowing down my hand, and you could just feel it easing down. And then all of a sudden, the swelling started coming, and you could just see the swelling coming on down. And after that, it turned into a painful, agonizing, it felt like my hand was broke, and then all somebody, also somebody jammed a dry thorn right in my hand. If you've ever been in dry thorns and gotten poked, you know it feels like poison. And man, that just started crawling up my arm, and all I could do was look at it and go, oh! I got to the hospital, and there was an Indonesian guy there, and he said, it was a dry strike. I said, no, I saw the venom on my hand. It hurts. He said, well, we're just going to have to watch you. I said, I'm going home. I'll let you watch me. He said, no, 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 you got to stay. And, of course, then the swelling started coming up, and they said, well, we may have to cut your arm open and relieve the swelling. We're going to have to watch it and see if it wants to pop, you know. So then they moved me up to a room, and about the middle of the night, my vital signs start going down. And then I'll, I'll spare you the long part of the story. I got to witness to a tongue speaker and tell her why tongue ceased in 70 AD and why she didn't get saved by having an emotional experience. It was believing in Christ. But anyway, we'll pass that. They had to give me the anti-venom. I'm still paying for it. Was it $12,000? I can't remember. It was a lot. Okay, still making payments on that. And I thought to myself, I was still young in my spiritual life. I had gone, I had learned a lot of doctrine. Why, why did this happen? I was doing the right thing. I'm learning Bible doctrine every day. I'm growing spiritually. I called Dr. Jim. I said, Dr. Jim, I just got bit by a snake. He said, what? I can't figure out why this was happening. He said, well, he said, have you been sinning? That's exactly what he told me. <laughs> no. And I was logging into his radio program every day. He knew it was just joking. He said, Brad, sometimes we suffer for doing the right thing. And I didn't realize it was providential preventative suffering that I was going through. And I would later go through another ringer or two before God knocked the arrogance right out of me. You know, I was pretty arrogant. But it took a lot of providential preventative suffering to knock the arrogance out of me and learn me, teach me how to cleave to God and his power. But I'm going to tell you, if you decide that you're going to fulfill your spiritual gift of pastor teacher you better buckle up because you're fixing to go through the ringer buddy god's going to make sure you you're not a quitter before you get right here that you're somebody who is going to be a high stepper through adversity see he doesn't need any weak need pastors behind the pulpit he needs somebody who can show his congregation how a good mule plows. He don't give up. When the when the when it gets tough, the tough keep going. So point number nine, each step of preparation must be accomplished with large doses of doctrine, which identifies the gift, aspires to the honorable office, motivates the preparation provides the self-discipline to complete the preparation for the ministry. Well, we've seen that Timothy had this spiritual gift of pastor-teacher, and Paul is applauding him saying that it is an honorable office if he aspires to fulfill his gift. Now we're going to keep moving on spiritual gifts. 
but we're going to keep moving on the qualifications for the pastor teacher as we go through the first seven verses or so of chapter three. I'm going to pray with you and we'll be dismissed this evening. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you that you have uh, given us the local church and not only that, the backbone of spiritual gifts to make it operate. Uh, Father, I thank you for those who have come before me having the gift of pastor teacher and done such a fine job that they have left a legacy behind which um, I humbly try to pick up and carry home. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.